So, Masavot Siman Lebanim, the actions of our, of our ancestors is a sign for us. What does that mean? It means that by them working and serving Hashem, doing everything that they did, they gave us the power, they gave us the ability to fulfill our own potential because they are within us. Um, I thought about it, like trying to understand it on a, on a practical level. Um, if someone comes, for example, from a background where the parent, his, her parents did not use clean language, for example, and so the language that he grew up with was full of very colorful words. And then they decided to overcome their own um, Nisayon in that way, saw it as a, as a Nisayon for starters, and then worked to overcome it. By the time they are parenting their own children, it is no longer a Nisayon for them. It's no longer a test, right? Um, which reminded me of myself because I grew up in Israel to English parents, grew up speaking English at home, Hebrew outside. So from the street, you pick up the, the language that you hear on the street. And so I knew all the Ivrit curses, which are actually not uh, in Ivrit because they're all from Arabic. However, they don't exist in Hebrew. However, I remember once I was about 10 years old and I was walking down the street with, with my mom, hearing some language being used in Arabic. And I said to my mom, how come there are no swear words in English? And it made me understand at that point, she goes, oh, I don't know. And I thought, right, okay. Later on, obviously in life, I realized um, how my mom has worked on herself and through being who she was, she provided chinuch for, uh, for her family. So the same for our ancestors, our avot, aimahot, and um, the rest of our role models within Tanakh, they provide us, provided us um, with the strength to be who we can be through their actions. Um, and when I'm talking action, I'm gonna talk about very internal things as well, not just external actions. Um, so I'm going to, I wanna visit uh, different places in Tanakh. Um, I'm gonna focus me, um, primarily on our Shivat Haroim, the seven shepherds, um, because they are the ones who conquered the seven Midot, which through them Hashem interact with us and we wanna strive and become who we can be. Um, so just before we start, um, I want to remind us all that we have just been through Shavuot, and I mean through Shavuot, because as we know, this, the time is round, right? The, the Shana in Hebrew, the year goes round. It doesn't go, it's not like history that goes back in time on a ladder of years, but we believe it's like a spiral. It goes round and round. And every year when we hit a point in time, we are hitting the same exact point. And when Hashem created the world, he created time. And with time, there was energy infused into time. So every moment and moment has a koyach, a specific special energy that it's infused with. However, we don't really know every moment and moment. And we do get a glimpse into it through our chagim and different times which Chazal tell us about. For example, Pesach is known to be as the time of freedom, breaking free. It's a good time to stop addiction and start working on it. Um, for example, Adar is known to be a time of e more simcha. Um, Sukkot is known to be at a time of Zman Simchatenu. It's called Zman Simchatenu. And Pesach is called Zman Cheruteinu. What is Shavuot called? Zman Matan Torateinu. In other words, Shavuot is actual time of the giving of the Torah. We've just been through the giving of the Torah. We were all there. And because time goes round and round, we literally got the Torah this past Shavuot. Just before Matan Torah, every year, just before Shavuot, we read Parashat Bamidbar. And in the Sedra of Bamidbar, every single one of us is counted. And there's a very, very important point to understand here, which is, sorry, which is that um, every single one of us is counted and without being counted, the Torah cannot be given. And 
it was Datan and Aviram, and it was Moshe Rabbeinu. Every single one of the Jewish nation has to be counted, otherwise we cannot receive the Torah. Meaning, each and every one of us counts. And it's you, and it's me, and it's Rav Chaim Kanievsky. We, we are all counted. Just it, it doesn't matter what your spiritual level is. You are so important, and without you, the puzzle is not complete. Just like I say, for Torah is not complete if one of the letters is um, damaged. Um, for the, the same way, the Am Yisrael is not complete if one of us is damaged, or not, for this purpose, I'm saying is not counted. In other words, you have to make yourself count, and you have to know that Hashem counts on you. So with this, I'm going to start. Um, and I want to look at our Avos. And before that, I'm going to um, mention again that we're looking at the seven character traits that, that each one conquered. So Abraham put the Midah of Chesed before everything else. He had a very, very difficult life. He had a father who, who gave him in to a wicked king to burn him. I mean, what kind of father is that? What kind of life did he have? Just think of the emotional uh, impact of that. Never mind everything else emotionally he had to then he, Hashem sent him out of his own country of his own birthplace think of being uprooted from your place I just spoke recently to a very big Rebetzin who moved from one city to another um, in the recent year and she's a very well known and a very important figure and she told me you know it was such a struggle in the same country a different city and she is really still finding her feet and I thought, wow, Abraham left everything, everything to the unknown, probably different language, everything different. And however, and he went through, then he gets then there's famine and he, and he has to wander from place to place. And then there is, uh, he gets involved in, in different battle that he's pulled into. Yet Abraham faces his, re the reality and recognizes Hashem through everything. We say Briat HaOlam was, the creation of he'elim that means the hiddenness hashem created the world and hidden hid himself within the, the the creation and it's down to us to find it abraham found hashem through looking around he found his own hashgacha pratis his own divine providence through looking around at the world so it's down to us to do the same we have the ability and more than that, we know that Hashem did not appear to the others through Midas HaChesed. When Hashem speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu, he says to him, Uvishmi Hashem, which is at Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud, which I can't pronounce. Uvishmi Hashem, Lo Nodati Alehem. I did not make myself known to the others with my name, Hashem. The name Hashem stands for Midas HaChesed. He only, he only ever appeared to Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov through Elohim, which is Midas Hadin. And it's fascinating how they still clung and recognized and, and saw Hashem in absolutely every single thing, and we're going to go through a bit more detail, in their lives. So they saw Hashem through the darkness, and they clung to Hashem through the darkness. Sarah at the age of 127 years old, we know that she was like 20 years old in beauty. And I had a very beautiful thing from Rebetin Lubin, who said on, about the word, Vehine Sarah Yaffa, that Abraham saw her reflection in the river, and behold, she was beautiful. She was an older lady, but he saw her beauty. What was this beauty? So the word Yaffa, if you break it up, it's ya po. Hashem is here. In every single situation that Sarah went through, she felt Hashem is po here right next to me. And therefore, she didn't feel it was difficult. She didn't develop any wrinkles on her face because there was no need for wrinkles. She didn't, she didn't have suffering per se because Hashem is here with me. I heard a very beautiful um, thing from Ravelli um, Melach Biederman who said that when, when um, someone feels a pinch, then you know that the, the one who's pinching you is very close. It's, he's right next to you. Um, 
And along the same lines, when, when there's war, when the World War, they had to put uh, dark material on the window to shield to shield the light so that they, the bombing, the airplane shouldn't see the light. And, um, and he said very beautifully that the, the, darker the, the darker the material, then the closer the light is, they had to cover it with a thicker dark material. And um, which, which means when, the, when you have a tsara, when you are having a hard time, a suffering, that means Hashem is really, really close. The light is right there behind. So when Sarah passed away, it says immediately after, the Hashem berach et Avraham bakol. And Hashem blessed Avraham with everything. That was Avraham seeing life. Hashem blessed me with everything. When? Just after my wife, my life partner passed away, he immediately got up and strengthened himself in the, in the Emuna. Yitzchak gave his life for the sake of Hashem's will. He wasn't told to. Hashem told Avraham to bind Yitzchak. And, and Yitzchak gave his own, was willing to give his own life for the sake of Hashem's will. And when you're willing to give your own will, that is called Mesiris Hanefesh. I'm putting myself on the side for the sake of your will, Hashem. I put my own ego on the side, my own wishes, my own, my own uh, life, really, because there's nothing greater than the will of life. So, Abraham, so Yitzchak said, I am giving my life to Hashem, or he, he was willing to. The nefesh, Mesiris Nefesh, the word nefesh stat, is the same as, an, as the word ratzon in terms of uh, Kabbalistic understanding. So when you're giving your ratzon to Hashem, your wishes, that is literally Mesiris Nefesh. Every time I want to say something, a comment, a criticism, a, it can be lots of different things that we want to say, and I hold it back. It's called restrain. I, I, I restrain myself from doing it. I overcome a, a, a wish, a will to do something in order to become. That is exercising Midas HaGevura. That is a way, is Yitzchak within, right? And that is with Mesiris Nefesh. Yitzchak gave us that. When Abraham was told to do the Akeda, he had to put aside, when I say the Akeda, I mean the binding of Isaac, he had to put aside all his own life Torah that he was teaching to thousands and thousands of people about kindness, about giving. He's going to slaughter his own son. There couldn't be something harder because everyone would go, what is Abraham doing? What? He's such a hypocrite. Everything he taught us, he's doing the opposite. However, if this is what Hashem told me to do, I'm putting my own ego on the side in order to serve Hashem. So Abraham was tested with the middle of Givura um, at the last test, even though his, his middle was chesed. It was, a, it was a very, very great task because it was completely against who he was. This happens to us on a daily basis. The amount of times we are challenged against our very own and we have to park our ego, put it on the side for the sake of accommodating someone else. And David HaMelech, David HaMelech had a, such a hard life. He was not recognized by his family as one of the family. He said in Tehillim, Muzar hayiti le'echai v'nochri livnei imi. I was strange in their eyes and I was estranged from my own brothers. When, when Shmuel HaNavi, the Navi Samuel came to um, the prophet, when he came to anoint David for, uh, to be a king, he said to Yishai, his father, please bring me out all your sons. I want to, I don't know which one, Hashem told me one of your sons is going to be king. I need to anoint them, bring, him, bring them all out. And they all came out and one by one, Shmuel tried to, he poured the oil over the head, nothing came out. One son, two sons, he goes through all the sons and the oil does not come out. None of them are the ones who are meant to be anointed. And he, sent to, and he says to Yishai, are these all your sons? Oh, one minute, there is another one here. Okay, we need to go get him. That's how much they regarded David as a son, as a brother. Yet, 
David recognized through everything he went through that Hashem is right next to him, right with him, because a continuation of that Pasuk is, and Hashem took me in. And later on, when, when Doeg, a very prominent person in the Jewish nation, cursed David HaMelech, he cursed King, King David, and he says, it's not him, it's Hashem, leave it, don't do anything about it, it's not him, it's Hashem. He's just a messenger. Now, if David would not recognize that Hashem is right with him through all the difficult times he went through, we would not have the book of Tehillim with us today. Can you imagine us without a Tehillim? If we look at Sarah, we look at Yocheved, Yocheved, Moshe's mother in Egypt, together with her daughter Miriam, they went the two Miyaldus, the two midwives, they're called into Paroi, and we're not scared. We only scared of Hashem. He could have killed them at the moment. They're called Nashim Ivriyot. Ivriyot means from the word Ever. Ever mean the, the other side. They see beyond. They see the other side and they stand on the other side. The Hebrew women are the Nashim Ivriyot. They see me'ever, they see beyond, they look to the future. And because of Nashim Tzidkaniyot, because of those righteous women, we were redeemed from Egypt. And it said that because of Nashim Tzidkaniyot, because of the righteous women, we will be redeemed. It's every single one of us. Every single one of us had the potential to be those Nashim Ivriyot, to be those Nashim Tzidkaniyot. Miriam, at the end of a very, very long time, after the whole, all the years of Shia Budin Mitzrayim, Avodas Parech, and all the difficult year they've been through, B'nai Israel pack to go very quickly. They're leaving Mitzrayim. What does Miriam take with? Tambourines. Because we are going to sing. Who takes a tambourine? Take bagel sandwiches. No, they're taking matzahs, and she takes tambourines. We're going to celebrate we will still sing and we will need those tambourines and she was right they came through the sea they crossed the red sea and what did she do she gave out those tambourines because they did sing and it was because she saw the future because of she, because she saw the future we had moshe rabbeinu if not for her we wouldn't have moses we wouldn't have moshe because because of her her parents remarried and had him um, so we're going down, um, I'm skipping a lot in, into the future, and we have Devorah, Devorah Hanevia. She was called Devorah Eshet Lapidot. She was the wife of a man called Lapidot. And he is not known to be a specially um, a, 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 a Tamid Chacham or Tzadik that we know about. All we know about him is that he's Lapidot. Why is he called Lapidot? The commentators tell us that he was a simple man. And he was not that spiritually commit, committed. And Devorah sat through the nights and weaved, she made tilot, wicks, for the menorah in the Mishkan. And then she gave them to, to her husband. His name was not really Lapidot, that's how he's known. And she gave him, she said, please take the, these up to the Mishkan with the hope that she'll, he'll go up to the Mishkan. And then in the Mishkan, meaning the, the tabernacle, she'll see the Kohen HaGadol working, the Levim singing, the priest in their work, and then he will be encouraged and he will be um, vitalized to work and, and serve Hashem. And she's, she reached such high, sitting the night, sitting awake at night and weaving and preparing tilot, wicks for the, for the menorah in the Mishkan. And she got to such heights that she became a leader. She became a prophetess. She sat and served the nation between the two palm trees so that she shouldn't sit and have yichud with men. And that's how she judged them. We look at Hannah, the mother of Shmuel, who was barren for so many years. And because of Hannah, we have the laws of Shmona Esrei today, of the Amida, because she stood there with her whis li lips whispering and not saying that we, we know a, a lot of halachas of Shmona Esrei we learned from Hannah. Hannah, who was barren for years and years, couldn't have a child. And, and with, with, from the depth of the heart, she cried to Hashem and begged for a child. What does she do? What does she do with that child? At the age of three years old, 
she gives him for the service of Hashem. And because of her, we had Shmuel, who was parallel to Moshe and Aharon together in his greatness. Our special mothers, our special fathers. We have Chulda, we have, um, which um, I'm not going to um, go on about, uh, hard times with Chulda. And then we have Esther. And Esther, the bit, what Esther did is just, it, it's, not, it's really difficult to comprehend. She gave up her marriage for the sake of the nation. It says, Ba'asher, Ka'asher, Avadati, Avadati. She says to Mordechai, I will go in there. But she says Avadati twice because the first time she, 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 it's by force, a second, she goes again twice. She can't go back to her husband, Mordechai. She's stuck. And, and after the story of Purim, Esther is left in the, in the palace on her own with Achashverosh. Not a pleasant story. How, how did Esther do this? How did she have the ability? Where did she get the car from? She exercised her pneumious internal work. And each and every one of us, it's not on the outside. It's all internal work. We look at our lives around us. We look at our experiences. And through that, we get the messages from Hashem. Your challenges, your surrounding, the, are the framework for your serving Hashem, for your Avodas Hashem. We look at our challenges and we say, okay, this is where I need to exercise. This is my Avodas Hamidos, my, my character traits working on gym, right? Like when we go to the gym and the work is really, really hard when you want to get your muscles going and you're lifting it up and you're lifting it up and you have such resistance, yet you work even harder and you overcome it. So the same us in our lives, we have to exercise our spiritual muscles and we do that through resistance and that's how we grow. So when we have a difficult time, it's a good time. It's an ultimate good, which is what the others saw. I'm going to continue. We have Abigail, who was another prophetess. Abigail was married to a very, very evil man. His name was Naval. I think Naval HaKameli. And when David came, King David was running on his runs, and he came about. Through, Naval was very rich, had lots and lots of money, and he was um, like a ruler over a certain area. And when King David came, he refused to give, provide him with anything and everything, nothing. You are having nothing from, from my property. His wife, Abigail, knew that if he does not provide David with anything, he deserves death by, by the, according to Halacha. She was married to a mean, wicked man. She was a righteous woman. What would be the natural thing for her to do? Let him die. He deserves it. But it's not what Abigail does. She goes and she speaks with David and she begs him to come and she serves David and all his people, the whole entourage. She, she gives him food and, the, and uh, that was working against the very instinct of a woman, I would think, you know, Naturally, I would let, let him go. What, what do you need him around still? Hashem did reward her. And when Naval found out, he actually died. And she ended up marrying uh, David. Uh, but she, what I'm saying is she, she worked against her instinct because she looked at the spirituality. What did the Torah tell me to do? What is the right and correct thing to do? Even though I don't want to do it, I put my ego on the side. I park myself on the side and I exercise my character traits to develop and become greater. Moshe said to Hashem, erase me from your book, but, let your, but keep your people. I don't need my name there. Leave me out of it. I'm not relevant. For someone to say such a thing, imagine you say you are a doctor. Forget all the words next to your name. All those years of work make no difference. Can you imagine such a thing? It's really hard. If you worked on something, you wanted to show, you want to present it. Moshe worked so hard. He was in the, in the pit in Midian. He was, he was estranged from, him, from his family for a long time. He was, he was lonely. He only came back to Egypt at the age of 80 years old. We don't know much about his life. He had a very, very hard life. Put, put it all on the side for the sake of your children, Hashem. I'm not relevant. Can you imagine such a thing? We can do that. The Koyach is within us. He was our father. He was our leader. 
Aharon, you take Aharon. The first thing I we that struck that strike strikes when Hashem says to Moshe, "You're going to go and be the leader. You're going to be the redeemer. You will take them out of Egypt." What did Hashem say to Moshe when Moshe raises his concern? But my brother Aaron, a he's older than me. B the entire time that I wasn't around, what was Aaron doing? Aaron was leading the nation. He was coping with all the difficulties. He was going and making peace with amongst husbands and wives. He was the rabbi. He was the leader. Do you know how difficult it is for someone to be in a position and then you go pushed aside? We don't need you. You're not relevant anymore. We've got a different leader, a different person. Who is it? Your younger brother. Moshe is very concerned. And what does Hashem say to him? Don't worry, Moshe. He will see him and he will be happy in his heart. Aharon doesn't know that the way he feels in his heart will be spelt out in the Torah. Can you imagine if he would know? He would probably dance. Think about it. Our emotions are recognized by Hashem. When you get hurt or supposed to get hurt by someone who makes a bad comment to you and you park yourself on the side and you say for the sake of you Hashem I won't get hurt because I know this is not meant to be I know this is not it's not you know it's, it's meant to be it's coming from you and I'm not it really doesn't matter it will be okay I'm not willing to have uh, to not have peace amongst human beings and so you're parking yourself on the side what happened at that point your feelings are recognized and it's written in the Torah. What else do we see about Aaron? Vayidom Aharon. When he comes, when the, the celebration of the Mishkan being erected, they're about to go in and his two very precious sons die in front of him. How does Aharon react? Vayidom Aharon. He was silent and he wasn't only silent in his, with his mouth that he didn't say anything. He was silent in his heart. Hashem, if this is what's meant to be, I accept. This coming Sedra this week is Baha'alotcha. And what do we know where it says about Aharon when he was, um, when he came up, lift, went up, to light the candles of the menorah, what do, we, what do we know about it? That there is two types of lights. There is the external light and is the hidden light, the or haganuz. Each and every one of us has a spark of the or haganuz within us, that hidden light, that's our neshama. And when Aaron comes to light the candle, he's lighting an external candle a physical flame, but he is lighting an internal candle, the hidden candle within each and every one of us through the commitment to Torah and mitzvahs, through exercising, working on ourselves, we are bringing that light about, we are making that light shine. I want to look at a Rachel, Rachel, gave the simonim to her sister. Rachel gave the simonim to her sister. Do we know what that means? The entire life dream, seven years, Yaakov is working. They love each other. They know their future is together. She knows she's destined to be the mother of Shivtei Ka, of the tribes of Hashem. And Leah is meant to marry Esav. So if Rachel doesn't marry Yaakov, who is Rachel going to marry? Potentially. However, Rachel puts everything on the side. My sister's shame is not worth my entire life. Her whole life, her future, her entire existence. I put it on the side. I'm not going to embarrass my sister. And she kept quiet. She kept silent. She didn't say that she knew. She didn't even tell her sister that what she did was a great deed to the point that later on in life, when Leah 
get a dudaim, those special um, plants from her from her son Reuven that are supposed to be good for for to have children. She Rachel asks Leah, "Can I please have them? Can I please have them?" Rachel's not been blessed. Leah has been blessed, and Rachel said, "Not bad enough. You took my husband. You also want my my shift with him." Leah was not even aware what Rachel did for her. Rachel didn't say, Leah, listen, daddy wanted to trick. And therefore, Yaakov knew that. He gave me simonim and I'm going to give them to you so you shouldn't be embarrassed. That wasn't what Rachel did. Rachel said, Yaakov taught me something. This is a Jewish way. This is what we do under the chuppah. Leah did not even know that what Rachel did was an unbelievable deed. And Rachel kept it quiet. She developed such incredible spiritual muscles. And she's our mother. And we've got that potential within. How much, how, how often do we feel like saying something? And then we exercise that keeping quiet. That very moment is a moment of growth. It's a moment of becoming someone. You are changing spheres every time you keep quiet and don't say something that you've really, you know, snapping at someone who said something really annoying or a child who did, ah, there's so many, you look around yourself, we all have our own challenges and which Hashem gave us in order to make us grow, just to keep quiet. And go back to Yaakov. Yaakov had such a difficult life. We look, we know Avraham had a difficult life. Yitzhak had a difficult life. Yaakov, it says, there's three places, it's fascinating, that the, the, the psukim say the word kol. Yaakov says to Esav, kach, take, yesh li kol. I have everything I need. I don't need anything else. I have everything I need. Yitzhak said, Va'ochal mikol, and I will eat from it all. I have everything. And Abraham, we said before, Vahashem berachet Abraham bakol, and Hashem blessed Abraham with everything. In Birkas Hamazon, in the grace after the meal, we say, Harachaman huye varechosanu bakol mikol kol. We are using those three lashonas, those three words that are used by our, by our avos. If we look when those pasukim, when those verses were said, they were all a time of difficulty. Abraham, it was shortly after Sarah died, his life partner, the love of his life. He shared everything with her. And immediately after she dies, Hashem berach et Abraham bakol. Hashem blessed him with everything. Yitzchak, when did he say that? Va'ochal mikol? The moment after he realized who Esav really was. He saw Gehinnom open underneath him. It was a revelation, this horrific, oh my goodness, this is who my son really is. Mikol, I have everything. And Yaakov, when he comes towards Esav, who comes towards him with 400 men, and he doesn't have good intentions. And Yaakov, yeshli kol, I have everything. How did they bless in the most difficult time? Where did they have that kaya from? This is a secret of, the, of our others. This is a secret that at the time of difficulty, they knew to bless. The Gemara said, the three are the ones who tasted the taste of Gan Eden, of the Garden of Eden in this world. And who are they? Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. What did the time, what did this taste that they tasted? They had their understanding and recognition, the suffering, the difficulty, the challenging in this world is good because it's a, it's a big chesed that we have it. Yaakov had such difficulties. He went through the Torah of Esau chasing him to kill him and he had to flee, leave his parents and not see them for 22 years. He had the Torah of Lavan who tricked him, who swindled him, who then chased him. We had the Tara of Rachel who died when she was young after the whole swapping and everything. Then he had again the Tara of Esav who came to uh, uh, try to annihilate, annihilate him. And then we have the Tara of Dina. When Dina is abducted, 
and mistreated. Then we have a flower of Yosef. The Yosef is lost. Can you imagine one per, per, one person going through so many tsaras? He had no, he didn't have a, a quiet moment. And he sees the tov. I have everything. I have everything. Everything is good. It says after the abduction of Dina and the, and the, and the, and the selling of Yosef, the Hashem hated him Yaakov, and Yaakov saw that it was good. All this goodness. The Rokeach um, said, the Rabbi um, Hasidic Sharav says, Min karatika anani bamerchavka. I called you from the difficult time and you answered me. It said, I, I called you from a tight place, right? Min a tight, confined place. I called you from the difficult, from the confined, from the tight place. Hashem answered me from a wide place. Hashem said, nah, ah, ah. you think it's tight, you think it's difficult. It's not, it's a melchav, it's a great place. It's, it's, and that is why we see Yaakov, the one who fathered the 12 tribes. Shiv Teka, he was the father of them the one who went through the most difficult. Give you an example, you, you know, you take a person, you see a person taking um, a very, very expensive material and he cutting it up, he's cutting it up to pieces. And it looks like, what are you doing? You're destroying, you're destroying. But if you realize that if you think he's the same person, then you think well, there, there must be a reason that he's doing it for. There must be a, a benefit that he's getting from it. So he's a, really a tailor who's cutting it in order to make a very expensive garment. And um, Rav Dessler said, gives an example of a person, you see a person who's standing in the corner of the street, taking off pe passengers, people who are walking up and down the street. He's taking the shoes off and on, off and on. You think he absolutely lost his mind. However, when you go into a shoe shop and a person is doing the same exact thing, you don't have an issue with it. Oh, that's okay. Why? Because you see, you see the benefit in what he's doing. He's doing it in order to make money, in order to sell shoes. So it's just difficult when we don't see the purpose, when we don't have the meaning behind. But when you know there is a meaning behind, there is a purpose to everything. Hashem knows it all. We don't. But if we know that Hashem is right with us, then there is a meaning for everything. So um, there is a purpose and it's easier to cope and it's easier to grow through difficulties when you are going through a difficult time. It says, David, King David, David HaMelech says, Yancheni b'magle tzedek leman shemo. We sing it on Shalashudas, right? The word Yancheni, it's from Tehillim 23. The word Yancheni is the same letters backward and forward. Yancheni. Yan Cheni, you can read it backwards and forwards. Why? Because it's Bemagale Tzedek. Hashem, Hashem is leading me in circles of righteousness. It's all for it's all correct. It's all meant to be. It's just that we don't know it. And we need to recognize that it's all good. Right, left, backwards, forwards, it's all good. It says that when after Yaakov had the battling, the battling, the, re the wrestling with the Malach, it says that Hashemesh Zarchalo, that the, the, the sun rose for him. And Rashi tells us that he came up early. The, si the sun rose early for him, especially for him. Why? Because the sun has healing properties and Hashem wanted the healing process to start straight away. In the previous Sedra, to the Sedra about the wrestling, it's Pashas Vayetze. What do we have in Pashas Vayetze? He, he goes to sleep. And it says, Hashemesh, the sun went down early. When the sun goes down, it seems dark. Time of darkness. Very often, the sun goes down and we have darkness and we don't see the good. It's difficult. We need to know that we need to learn from Yaakov. Hashem took the sun away two hours earlier when he went to sleep then in order to rise it earlier for him many years later. 22 years later, the sun rose early for him. So it seemed like it went down. Why did it go down? Why did I have to have dark time? So that you can have good times later on. We need to remember that. It says that anyone who prolongs the word echad, 
when we say the Shema, his life is lengthened. What is, what, I want to look at the Pasuk Shema. Pasuk, the Shema, we say Shema Israel, listen, O Israel, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. So let's look a second at the word Israel. But we, the, we have to, when you say the Pasuk Shema, you actually need to focus on it. You have to have the right intent. So every morning and every night when you go to sleep, we say the Shema twice a day. And, and that we say, listen, O Israel. Who is Israel? Every single one of us is Israel. Who is Israel? Israel is Yaakov. What do we say about Yaakov? What do we know about Yaakov? Yaakov, after the battling with the Malach, it says, now I'm going to call you Israel. Ki sarita im kel. Because you wrestled with God. So he wrestled. What we, do, we know that the Malach who wrestled with him met every, different commentators, say different things. Something he was a Tsar of Asav. He was the spiritual source of Asav. So he was, he was a, and the, the, you know, some, he was an evil inclination. He was a Yitzhahara. He was, um, he doesn't have a name. Do you know why he doesn't have a name? Because the evil inclination appears to us every time in a different way. That it, it changes, it, it, it dresses up in different forms in order to challenge us in different ways. However, it doesn't say because you won. Yaakov had a battle and then he, he won the battle. Why is he not called um, Netzach because you, uh, Nitzachta, that you won the battle? Why, would, why is he called Kisarita, that you battled? Yisrael, for the, to remember the battle. Because that battle, that is what makes us grow. That recognizing that there is a battle coming and here we are battling. The very moment that you pick the challenge and you fight against, at that very moment when you hold back saying something not nice or say something nice when you don't feel like saying something nice or whatever it is on your, in your arena of battle that you are exercising and doing, that very moment of battle you are growing, you are changing spheres, you are growing as a person, you are changing, you are no longer Yaakov, you are now Israel, you are a fighter, you are fighting to grow. Now we say the word Hashem, Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud, which is Hashem Adnut, master of the world, it's Hashem in Midas Harachamim, and it's Adon HaOlam, master of the world, who Haya always was, who Have always is, and will always be. Then we say the Shem Elokeinu. When we say Elokeinu, it's takif, strong, bala yecholet, all capable, ilat ha'ilot, the cause of causes, sibata sibot, the reasons of reasons, uval hakochot kulam. All the powers in the world belong to him as source from him. And then we say the word echad. And echad stands for aleph, the numerical value one, is Hashem. Echad, Yachid, Umeyuchad, the one and only, none like Hashem. Then Chet in the word Echad stands for eight, the seven firmaments, the Sheva Rekiim, and the land, and the Aretz. And then the Daled stands for the four directions and the four components which we're made from. And our four, and our Midas come from those four components. You have fire, you have water, you have the earth and you have the wind, the spirit. So those four things are components and we have different moods. So the, the message of the four of the Dalet in Echad is it doesn't matter what mood you are in. It doesn't matter what actually happened. Remember, Echad Yachidu Miyuchad, Hashem is here and Hashem is with you. So this is a kavana to have when you say the Shema every morning and every evening. And if you say it, your life is actually lengthened. Why? Because at that very moment, when you have that intent, you are growing. We have to remember to put Hashem as our king every single moment. After the, the battling, after the wrestling with the Malach, that is, Yaakov is no longer Yaakov. He's now Israel, he's changed. So when we hear, when, when, when you hear someone speaking 
something which they should, shouldn't say or say something to you. And you then recognize, I have a battle. Wait, something's going wrong here. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to do something. You are changing. You keep going up and up in levels. It says, Vayivater Yaakov Levado, and Yaakov was left on his own, and Hashem, Veniskav, Veniskav Hashem Levado, Vayivater Yaakov, and Hashem was on his own, Yaakov was on his own. We learn a very big message from here that Yaakov was left on his own and he knew Hashem was right there with him, which is right. He says, he fought with, with Hashem. Hashem was right there with him at every moment and moment. He wouldn't let go of that knowledge that Hashem was right there with him. And again, he's not called, uh, he's not nicknamed after the battle with uh, any nickname about the winning, about the about the fact that he won the battle? No, he's named after the battle itself. Each and every one of us is, is Yisrael, Shema Yisrael. It's you and me, every single one of us. Um, I wanna look at another point that he, with Yaakov, and that is when Yaakov continued on his journeys, he gets to a place where he builds homes for himself and his family and all his, the people with him. And it says that he built and his animals, Sukkot, huts for his animals. Al Ken Kara Lamakom Sukkot. And then he called it the name of the place Sukkot. Why not call it homes? Why call it Sukkot? Because he looked after the cattle, and Ravosna tells us that the main thing of a person, the main growth of a person, is that which he does for others, not for himself. Um, it's a very, very famous. Uh, um, speaker in Israel uh, years ago, his name was Rav Shalom Shvadron. He was a big known Magid. And he knew the, Chaz the Chazanish, who was a very big Rav, um, very well. And he had an open door uh, by him. So many people used to ask the Rav, Rav Shalom Shvadron to go and ask the Chazanish for brachas for them. And time and time again, it was not today. The traffic, the, the the journey was not easy. He used to go by bus. He was a, tra a, a you know every time two hours there, two hours back. It was a big schlep. And he one time said to the chazanish, you know, every time I go, it takes away from my learning. I could learn so much Torah if I wouldn't be coming to you backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards for the sake of other people. And there's a lot of Torah that's being lost over these journeys. And the chazanish said to him, Chesed is a pintala of the neshama. It's a point of the neshama. Doing for others, it's a neshama that will make you grow. The, the gashmius of another person, the physical needs of others is your spiritual growth. When you're doing for other people around you, it's your spiritual growth. It's a very encouraging thing. It's amazing because when you're making a sandwich for a child or you're serving a, a meal to a spouse or, or a neighbor or whatever it is, that each one in their own circumstances, we're looking, give, make a phone call to people who need it. Every time you do that and you make it, it's, you're inconvenienced, conven conveniencing, you're making it inconvenient for yourself for the sake of another person, you are growing spiritually. So every single one of us need to remember that. And it's interesting because following the battle that wrestling the Yaakov had with the Malach, we are told that we can't eat the Gid Hanashe, a certain part of the animal. Why? Because Yaakov was left on his own. And because he was left on his own, he had the battle, the wrestling. Therefore, we should know we must never live. We, we, till today, we mustn't eat that part to remember that we shouldn't leave others alone. I think Corona time made it much more, much more um, real that we are aware, aware that people are on their own and we need to think outside of our own, of our own place. Um, we need to make an effort for it. Oh, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna skip. Um, uh, Yosef. Um, Yosef chose to see Hashem's closest to him at every single moment to the point that as he's sold, he's a 17 year old lad. That's how he described. He's a lad. He's a boy. He lost his mother years ago. His brother didn't treat him properly. And then he sold. And, and it's very, fa it's a very famous um, commentator to tell us that when he was um, 
traveling, there was a spe there was a nice smell in the chariot, in the wagon where he was traveling. And what do we know from that? We know from that that the he recognized Hashem's hashgacha pratis. Hashem is with me at this most horrific time. Why? Because the Ishmaelim that were taking him normally carried um, ga gasoline, and now they were carrying uh, perfumes. So he thought, wow, look how Hashem is making the journey easier for me. I'm not going to stink of gasoline. I'm going to have this perfume, right? And he, um, we know that he had this big Nisayan with Potiphar's wife, which he, which he resists by using the power of imagination. The power of imagination is a very, very powerful thing. And we generally look at it in a negative way because it, it, it gets us to do, you know, you imagine things and then you want to do them. So you imagine a very nice meal and then it's hard to keep, not to keep kosher because you want to, each one on their level. Um, and then what, what, ya what Yosef did is he used the power of imagination to bring up in front of him the image of his father. Ooh, I can't do sin, daddy's watching me. Right, and then, and that's how he fought. That that's how he he managed to fight the sin. Now he was then caught, right, and and he's sent into the dungeons. He's in the dungeons, and then he's described by the Torah as Ish Matzliach. You know, what Matzliach means a successful person. There is no other person in the Torah who is described as successful. He's also described the only man who's described as handsome. He what did what did what did the beauty that Yosef had? Yosef had the recognition, and we know it's also the beauty that our Imahus had. It's the recognition that the outside and the inside need to match. It's not a a, a beautiful gift that you're given and wrapped absolutely gorgeous, and when you open it, there is a raw potato inside. That is the opposite of beauty, right? That's external beauty without the internal, so the disappointment. But with, ya with Yosef and Arimahos, the beauty was such a real beauty because the inside and the outside matched, there was symmetry. And Yosef kept the knowledge. He recognized as a 17 year old boy who did not have his mother caring for him. His emotional state could have been so jeopardized, so compromised, yet, in the dungeons, we know that he kept a smile, a smile on his face at all times. And where do we know this from? Because when the, the butler and the baker didn't have a smile, their face was fallen. He recognized, he said, why is your face fallen? Like, what's wrong in being in a dungeon, right? Why is your face fallen? Seriously, Hashem is with us. Why should we have a hard time? And that's when he's described as Ish Matzliach a successful man because he recognized that Hashem is with me through the darkest time in the dungeon. He's not called Matzliach for the first time when he is a king, second to the king and ruling over the whole world. He is called Matzliach successful already back in the dungeons. And he understands that having a beautiful cover to a Sefer Torah without a Sefer Torah inside is empty. It's not real beauty. I am the Sefer Torah inside the beautiful cover. And you are that Sefer, Sefer Torah inside a beautiful cover. Now, oh, I need to wrap up. Um, okay, so we have a choice. We have a choice and we need to recognize that we have a choice. And it begins with the Moach, with the brain. And we are called a Bat Melech. Every single one of us is a daughter of a king. When it said in the, in the Gemara, bat or bar something, like bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, it's the essence of the thing. You're not the daughter of mitzvah. It's the essence of what you are on that day. So when it speaks about kamsa, bar kamsa, it's the essence of who they were. It's not the real name. And when it speaks about bat melech, which we are, kol kevuda bat melech pnima, my covered is internal. It's for me, myself. What do they mean melech? Melech is the acronym, acronym of Mem Lamed Kaf. Moach, Lev, my, my brain, my heart, and my kidneys slash liver, Kaved. Um, and the, the Nefesh Abehemis, that your soul, that, which is like that your animalistic soul, lives in your liver. 
that's in a source of life. It, it, you know, it's where the, most of the blood is, which is why we don't eat uh, blood from animals. And, and um, the, your soul of um, the emotional lives in your heart and your higher soul, neshama, lives in your moach, in your brain. A melech is someone who puts the brain first, then the heart, then the desires. First, Hashem's view. First, the Torah view. What did that Torah say? What am I supposed to exercise here? Recognize I have the Chira. Then move down to my heart. What's in my heart? My emotions. But my emotions should be governed by my intellect. And only then do we go down to our drives. So we make a bracha before we eat because we have a recognition of Hashem providing us. Once you have, you recognize that you have the Bechira, you have the choice, that's already a level. It's a very high level. I, I'll tell you a cute story. My, my little one, um, Yehuda, he was four years old a few months ago, and he spilled milk all over himself as he was trying to be very independent and give himself cereal. And he normally, his natural reaction, if someone would spill something on him, would be, I'm going to get you. I'm going to do this. Right. I'm going to punch you. I don't know. Right. He's going to really, really cross. However, I said to him at that very moment when he spilled milk all over, it was on his clothes. It was on the table, in the floor, on the chair. And I said to him, Yehuda, why are you not shouting at yourself? Look what you did to yourself. Say, Yehuda, what have you done to me? What have you done to me? Yeah. You make me wet. You make me dirty. Now I have to clean it all up. Now I don't have my cereal. And he burst out laughing. And I said to him, why are they funny? because you're not going to shout at yourself, are you? But if it's someone else, you would. In other words, you have a choice to shout or not. Because had it been you, if it's not, if it would be someone else, you would shout. It's you, you're not shouting. You have Bechira. And he reckoned and he understood what I said and he laughed. He said, you're right. If it would be someone else, I would, right? So as young as four, you understand that you have Bechira. You have a choice. And every time you make a choice, you are changing your arena of battle. You are growing. The, the, the battle itself change you, changes you from Yaakov to Israel. And every single one of us is asked. The Torah was given to us human beings, not to the Malachim, not to the angels. The angels are higher from us spiritually by creation, but we have the potential to be higher than the Malachim because the Malachim do not have choice. They're given a task, they need to fulfill it. We have choice. And by acting according, uh, upon our choices, we then ascend to even higher than the Malachim, which is why Yaakov won the battle against the Malach. You realize? Yeah. And Yaakov is within, it, within me and he was within you. When Hashem created man, he says, Na'ase Adam, let us make man, mankind. Who was Hashem talking to? Naase. We don't believe in a treason or, you know, there's one Hashem. So who is Hashem talking to? Various commentators say different things. One of the commentators says that, I think it's Rav Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, who says, Naase Adam, Hashem was talking to you and me. Hashem was talking to the potential of man. Hashem said, I will make the raw material. I will give you the potential, all your greats and all your down, all your goods and all your, you know, we come with good, with great, with greatness, potential and with weakness. Hashem will give me all the raw materials. It's down to me. It's down to me to make man, to become who I can be. And after 120, Hashem is not going to say to me, why were you not Joanne? Hashem is going to say, why were you not Essie? Right? Did you become who you can be? Did you become man? Did you actualize your potential? In the morning we say, The emuna should, we should say, Rabba emunati, my emuna is great. What do we say? Rabba emunatecha Hashem, Hashem, your emuna in me is great. If Hashem believes in me, Will I not believe in me? Hashem believes in you. You have to believe in you. And last, and last but not least, I want to say, Rabbi Silva, who used to, we, we, you know, some of us know Rabbi Silva, he used to say a line which I absolutely love and quote to myself a lot. He says, he say, don't call me from, 
call me a striving Jew. Because if I'm not better today than I was yesterday, and I'm not better tomorrow than today, then what am I here for? I give us all a blessing that we take all the koichas and all the potential that we have and actualize it. Thank you very much for listening.